I know some of y'all are thinking, I don't know that I've ever heard a message on Mother's Day from Second Kings, but uh, I promise you that there is a mother in this story. So, <laughs> um, so Second Kings chapter four, verses one through seven. When you got it, uh, so that I can know and so that we can do so in reverence to the reading of the Word of God, would you stand? Once again? I won't be as long as last week. <laughs> Second Kings chapter four verses one through seven. Uh, you follow along in whatever translation I'm reading from the the Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, but you follow along in your translation. It says one of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, "Your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves." Elisha asked her, "What can I do for you?" Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go and borrow empty containers from everyone, from all your neighbors. Don't just get a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all these containers. Set the full ones to the side. So she left. After she had shut the door behind her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers, and she kept pouring. When they were full, she said to her son, Bring me another container. But he replied, There aren't any more. Then the oil stopped. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons can live on the rest. May God bless the reading. So, see, I told you it had a mom, okay? But uh, let's just kind of break this down for a second. Um, I've entitled this sermon today, When Obedience Doesn't Make Sense, okay? There are a lot of things in this passage that don't make a whole lot of sense when we first look at them. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead and... Initially, I had these, just in case if y'all didn't have anything for Mother's Day, I was going to do it as a Mother's Day thing, but I think I've got enough everybody can have one. So this will be a little object lesson, I guess, at work. Um, so, um, so first of all, um, of course, the main prophet in this passage is Elisha. And Elisha, just for a little background on Elisha, Elisha literally means, my God is salvation, or God is my salvation, okay? So there's already within the name Elisha this idea of God saving us. Saving us from dire circumstances, saving us from trouble, calamity, saving us, just plain old saving us, okay? Um, and um, Elisha, this is interesting, I didn't know this until I started studying for this passage in this study, but did you know that Elisha is actually venerated as a prophet, not only in Judaism and Christianity, but even the Muslims, those in Islam, venerate him as a prophet as well, and so do some of the writings of the uh, Baha'i faith out there actually consider him a prophet as well, so... That, that speaks loads when not only your own main sort of religion, but others see you as a prophet as well. That's pretty amazing. Um, I'm not saying that I'm adding any credence to those other faiths, but I said that speaks a lot to me when it says that all these other religions consider him a prophet as well. So, thank you. So, Elisha, of course, we know was the disciple and protege of Elijah. And anybody that's taught vacation Bible school or something, you know it's easy to get those two names mixed up and twisted. Okay, Start calling Elisha, Elijah, and Elijah, Elisha. But um, what we know of that occurrence was that Elijah called Elisha to follow him. And um, 
Elisha gave up everything. Uh, according to the story, he was out there plowing the fields. It says that those fields were being plowed by 12 yoke of oxen. So 24 oxen out there plowing the field. Now, there's some disagreement amongst commentators as to whether that meant that Elisha was a really wealthy and rich man or whether he was just a person that was plowing that land for somebody else. We don't know if it was his land or somebody else's, but we do know that when Elijah called him, strike up the barbecue, boys, he chopped up the yoke, he made a fire, and he cooked those oxen and had a last little feast with his family, and he's on the road with Elijah. Um, Elijah was the prophet that was taken up in a whirlwind, and when he was going to depart from Elisha, Elisha basically requested a double portion of that spirit. And we see it in Scripture because, according to what we have recorded in Scripture, Elisha performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did, according to what we have recorded in Scripture. And... Um, he was also accepted as the leader of the sons of the prophets. Well, Elijah, we didn't have a physical body because he got caught up in the whirlwind of God, but we know that Elijah was so full of God's spirit and power that they accidentally dropped a dead body and it touched the bones of Elijah and brought him back to life. Now, that's something. I, there's a t-shirt, a meme out there nowadays that says, uh, you know, I want to be so full of Jesus that when a mosquito bites me this summer, it says there's power in the blood, right? right. Well, Elisha was that guy, okay? His literal remains brought a person back to life. So Elisha, he was in touch with God. But Elisha's not the focus of this passage, is he? It's this poor widowed woman, Okay? So I want to start out with focusing on in verses 1 and 2, we notice that she is in dire circumstances. She is in very dire circumstances. One, she's obviously been fairly recently with it, okay, because she says she's making Elisha aware, your servant has died, my husband, and you know that he loved the Lord and he followed you and he served you, okay? We also know that apparently um, she was under some crushing debt because the creditors were coming and she had nothing of value to give them. So what were they going to do? They were going to take her only two sons from her to pay off the debt. Because one of the things about that culture and context was we know from things like Ruth and from other books of scripture that it was very much a thing that there was no social security. There was no, you know, getting that uh, husband's pension or otherwise having those benefits signed over to you. Once it came down to it, then all you had were the other young men in your household for making a way. And so she was in some bad, bad straits. Of course, this crushing debt was also impending it had the impending compounded loss that she really had no other recourse that when that creditor comes, she was going to have to just let him have her sons. And then we see Elisha's question in verse 2. What can I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except the jar of oil. Now, to be clear, what his question meant was, Basically, what do you have in the house of value? It doesn't mean that the jar of oil was the only thing she had. She probably still had the normal trappings, but apart from any sentimental value, they probably didn't have any value that she could sell to pay off the debt. Um, I have to wonder, though, in this, in this widowed mother's state, when the prophet asked that question, I wonder what went through her mind. You know, because some prophets did it for profit, right. right? I mean, you have the account of Balaam where a renegade king comes and asks him to curse the nation of Israel. 
and he's going to pay him to do so. And so when this prophet, even though she knows her husband has served and loved the Lord, when he asks the question, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Kind of almost like when you take that car to the mechanic shop and he's like, well, how much you got? <laughs> That's kind of where she's at here. Um, so she's in dire circumstances. We can all see that. Second part is she's given some odd instructions. Okay? So first of all, he says, go, in verse 3, and borrow empty containers for everyone. Okay, so one, go, and I'm like, you know, if her household, all of a sudden, her and her sons are headed out here, there, and everywhere, what would that look like to the creditor? You run it, right? You're, you're defaulting on this debt, and you're taking off, right? Number two, borrow from your neighbors. She's already in debt where her sons are threatened and he's telling her go borrow a little more from those around you. That's, that must be pretty strange instructions for you to hear. Because I can't sell the stuff that I borrowed from somebody, right? Because I'm just digging that hole deeper, right? Borrow from your neighbors even in the midst of debt. And then he says once you've done collected all this Come in and shut the door. So it's only the three of you. Kind of echoes with places where Jesus was dealing with someone that was deathly ill or had died. And he says, come in and shut the door. In other words, it also echoes those ideas of praying in private and seeking the Lord in private. So your father who sees in secret will know. Not letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing. All of this kind of echoes within this passage and says, then this to me is the oddest instruction of all. Now, the word for jar or oil or vessel that they have there, we're not talking like one of these big uh, decanters like they had that they would kind of bury or they would set these big tall jugs like you would see in some of your Bible movies and portrayals, it was probably just a little small jug. jug. You know, kind of like the little uh, extra virgin olive oil that we get at the grocery store that comes in a little small bottle. You know, it's not a lot. Okay? And it would have probably been olive oil. But here's the thing. He says, start pouring out your oil vessel into the other oil vessel. Now, what does common sense tell you? If our common sense, if we're thinking about the instructions that this prophet just gave, this amount that I've got, that's all it's going to be, right? right? And if I pour it out in other vessels, now I risk losing it as I'm transferring it to other vessels. Um, anybody ever work with a lot of oil, what's true of oil? It kind of sticks on the edges of the container, doesn't it? It doesn't all just come out just because I tump it over, right? That's why when you go to the oil change, it's still going to take you at least quite a few minutes because it's got to all drain out. And so by me pouring this vessel out into other vessels, what's going to happen? I'm actually reducing the quantity because now it's coating the size of other vessels as I pour it out in other places. So, to me, these instructions just sound crazy. You know, here she is in debt. She's asked to go out, borrow from others, and now nothing's happened. I've still got the same amount of stuff of value that I had before. i just got to start pouring it out in the other vessels. There are two parts to this. In verse 5, we see them displayed. 
Notice what it says in verse 5. He gets done with the instructions and he says, pour the oil into a container, set the full ones to the side. Verse 5. So she left. She went out. It doesn't say she thought about it. It doesn't say she said, Elisha, this doesn't make a lot of sense. It says she went out and she did it. And after she had shut the door behind her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers. So I'm like, she's like, okay, well, I'm going to get started doing what the prophet said. Y'all go grab up some more, you know, and she, she's keeping to have them go and, and keep and to grab these containers. And when they're full, of course, well, we'll get to that. So my thing there is there are two things we see in that brevity of she just left and she got to the task that is there. One, she had faith. She trusted what the prophet and what God had spoken through the prophet. Even though she didn't understand it, she trusted. And just like our brother James many, many, many centuries later will tell us, faith without works is dead. So not only did she believe what the prophet said, she demonstrated that she believed it because she did what he said. She enacted on what he had said. So um, this basically are two parts of the same coin. There's faith and there's obedience. We can be faithful all day, but if we're not obedient, then isn't a whole lot going to happen. And we can be obedient, but if we have our faith misplaced or placed in the wrong thing, then the glory is not going to God when we're obedient, is it? <coughs> so, faithful obedience. As soon as she left, she got to it. Uh, my mom, my mom, is famous for saying this when you're trying to make a decision and you're just like hemming and hawing and you just won't make a decision on something. She always used to say when I was growing up, think long, think wrong. Think long, think wrong. And that's especially true when it's got direct instructions from God's mouth or from his word, right? When we've got clear direction from God, if we think long, we're going to think wrong. And all up to this part, I mean, although you could say about um, Elisha and his instructions and being the prophet, up to this point, we haven't really seen God in this story. You know, he's been in the background of what's going on because he was one that her husband feared and served and... Um, all of these things are going on, and of course, Elisha is a prophet, but verses 6 and 7 are where we see God involved in the story. It says, And when they were full, she said to her son, Bring me another container. But he replied, There aren't any more. And immediately, the oil So, the extent of their faithfulness, God kept being faithful to let it flow. This echoes the New Testament. Loaves and fishes, a little boy's lunch. And what does it do? It feeds people. And not only does it feed people, but notice this. She didn't take it upon herself to assume what she was supposed to do with that oil. Once it stopped, once she came to the end of what the prophet had said, what did she do? Verse 7, she went and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. So, she didn't take it upon herself to assume 
what God wanted her to do with that horse. She went to the prophet and waited for the instruction from God, which was, yeah, go sell it, pay off the debt. And just like with the loaves and the fishes, what happened? Not only did he provide a meal for the moment or take care of the immediate need, but he made provision for an abundant life to come on. Because what did it say of the loaves and fishes? There were 12 basket full left over. Here, not only did she have enough to pay off this crushing debt that was going to cause her to lose not one, but both of her sons to slavery, it's enough to pay off that debt and the prophet says, and you and your sons can live on the rest. That's nice. <laughs> so, brings me around to what's the point of this story for us? Though? This was this widow, this was the narrative, this was where this happened. God will fill willing and available vessels until there are none left. If we present our empty vessels before God and submit them and give them to God, he will fill them with his precious Holy Spirit and do a wonder in our lives. But it goes further than that. A lot of churches get stuck because we get happy with, okay, well, we got this, we got this, and we get into this bad uh, us for and no more sort of syndrome where we get into a Bible study group and, oh, it's real nice and we don't want to have any outside come in because that would make mess up what we got here. That's stopping short of collecting vessels, isn't it? Because if we keep providing more opportunities for folks, then God's going to fill those opportunities. Scripture tells us, even way back before this widow and Elisha, that there was a problem in the camp of Israel. They had these snakes going through the wilderness that would go and they would bite people. And what did he instruct Moses to do? He instructed him to craft this bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And if anybody just looked to it, they would be cured. They would be taken care of in the snake. Of course, we know that bronze serpent and that pole, that was an image of Christ being lifted up on the cross. And scripture says that if the Son of Man be lifted up, what will happen? He will draw all men unto himself. So, all we've got to do is provide the opportunities for lifting up the Son of God. And it will draw people unto him. If we provide empty vessels before the Lord, he will fill them if we are faithful and obedient to do what he's asked. Of course, sometimes we get ahead of things and we make our own assumptions. You know, I wonder what would have happened, or what if, so to speak, if she had just decided, oh, well, I've got all these jars full of oil now, and just assumed that, okay, let me go sell them. Would it have been the same outcome? I don't know. It, I, I would think that it might not. Because the importance for us is to know that it's never about us or what we have. It's always about God and what he can do within the situation. And so um, maybe she wouldn't have gotten as good a price. Maybe she would have gotten just enough to get her sons out of servitude. We don't know the age of the sons. Would they have been capable of doing work and providing for the household? Or were they just babies, you know, uh, and couldn't do anything? And so, you know, there are a lot of possibilities, but the truth is she waited for further word from God. You know, 
How often do we just jump out there and say, oh, this has got to be what God wants to do? And then the bottom line is, if we are faithful and obedient, God can restore what was broken, lost, or in danger or jeopardy. And he can provide for things that we haven't even imagined. So, uh, in conclusion, I just want to apply this idea of faithful obedience to three sort of areas in our life. One, have you faithfully obeyed to the point of having your debts forgiven? In other words, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and been obedient to proclaiming his name as your Lord and Savior so that your debts can be canceled? Two, have you faithfully obeyed even when you understand the task, like technically what I'm supposed to do, but you don't understand the why. Even if we don't know why God has given the instructions he has, are we going to do it anyway? Are we going to serve? Are we going to follow? Are we going to be faithful even when it doesn't make sense? And then the last one of these is are you faithfully obedient to continue to bring other vessels to the building of God's house. Because it doesn't just start with our vessel. Once we get our filling, once our once we get feel fulfilled by God and His Spirit, we don't have to travel very far to see plenty of empty vessels. And so what are we doing to 